He is a man from Liverpool, 74. He was a professional wrestler in the 60s. In 1965, he got a conviction for indecently assaulting a young boy at his flat in the West End. He somehow, God knows how the system used to work in those days, managed to get a job as a PE teacher within months of that conviction at a school in East London, where he stayed until 1992 and he retired. Um, we know that he's been abusing children since 1961 up until we're aware of the sort of mid-80s. He's never been married, he's never, as far as we can tell, had any kind of adult relationship. Our thinking is that he's a career fixated paedophile um, who specifically got involved in education just to abuse boys. Within the school that he was working in, he was a PE teacher. He, he it seems, actively secured for himself the swimming portfolio. And most of the offences that have taken place have seemed to have been in changing rooms of one sort or another. Um, which is why we're very, very keen now to establish if since 92 he's got involved in any sort of sports clubs, swimming clubs, anything involving children. Having watched the ex-teacher's front door, the police know that every morning he leaves at exactly 5.37. Today is no exception. The plan is to follow him and find out what he gets up to during the rest of the day. If the police see that he is having any contact with children, they will immediately intervene and arrest him. It turns out that his morning activity is working as a car park attendant. The police have him under surveillance because four former pupils have come forward with serious allegations of sexual abuse. It would often start with a punishment he inflicted as a PE teacher. He called it double barreling. He would clamp a boy face down between his legs and use both hands to slap or fondle the boy's buttocks. Unfortunately, a lot of it's about justifying yourself. Um, one of the things that we have to consider is whether or not someone's still abusing children. And if we hadn't done this, then we could be open to criticism um, for doing nothing to find out. It's about justifying yourself. Um, one of the things that we have to consider is whether or not someone's still abusing children. And if we hadn't done this, then we could be open to criticism um, for doing nothing to find out. You can never be 100% certain that it's not happening, but at least we've got, if, you know, if we've done a day surveillance and nothing's come of it, we've got that to show. You know, it's what I call public inquiry policing. When you ask difficult questions five years' time by some uh, know-it-all barrister, you can you know, throw things back in his face. The ex-wrestler and teacher was recently at the Old Bailey facing charges of indecent assault and buggery. The victim was a wrestling fan as a child and was abused by his hero when he was 12. It wasn't until many years later as an adult that he was able to come forward and make a statement. The case was thrown out of court on a technicality. The prosecution used the word rape on the charge sheet when they should have used the word buggery which was the correct term at the time of the offence. The police are determined that the victims in this case will not be let down. The incident was I'd been called playing truant and I'd been given the cane by the head teacher and I went into the PE lesson late. Now, of course they locked all the changing rooms so uh, I stuck my head in the gym door and said that I'd been to the headmaster and been caned for playing truant and Mr <laughs> took me upstairs and um, started rubbing my bottom where the cane marks were and slipped his finger between uh, my bottom and the cheeks of my bottom and I remember uh, shuddering and, and like, you know, what are you doing? And he, uh, he threatened me 
and said to me, if you ever tell anybody, they won't believe you, they'll think that you're a queer boy and I'll make your life hell. So he actually frightened me. Kevin Charlton is one of the former pupils to come forward with allegations against their PE teacher. He was 12 when the abuse took place. The worst one was the third time that he did it because he, he started getting um, a lot more sexually aroused by me um, and would kiss me again and would lick my nipples and would take his penis out and start rubbing it and asking me if I wanted to rub it and uh, sent me over to get the medicine ball and come up behind me and try to penetrate me. He didn't, but he tried to. Um, and it was just very, very, very difficult to deal with those things. Uh, and I remember reacting quite angrily because I, I literally had enough of this and, and told him that I was going to effing go home and tell my dad and my dad would come up and beat him up and if my mum found out and he, he realised that he'd pushed too far this time and he backed off from me uh, and left me alone and then went on to his next victim. Uh, it would always come up to me after we would come out of the swimming pool, you know, make sure that we're getting undressed and getting dressed to get ready to go back to school. And um, j just one day he came in, while I was wiping myself with a towel, I had no, I had no clothes on. He told me to um, turn around and face the wall. So uh, I remember the exact, exact words which he said, he said, I beg your pardon. I said to him, what are you doing here? Even take your towel away and turn around and face the wall. So I, I turned around and face the wall, and he told me to bend over. And I, and I did exactly what he told me to. I bent over, and he, and he got his hands. I don't know if left or right, and he got his hand, and he, and he started abusing me, touching me from behind. Feeling my body, you know, and I was, I was getting very, very nervous. Like, why is he doing this to me? You know, why pick on me? But what have I done to upset him? And this was repeated, repeated every week for nearly four years. You know. Control my pain. Yeah, subject is uh, left a lot, moving down Royal Street. Can. Right. Yeah, he's uh, left the car park. He's now heading along Royal Street. He's turned right. He's turned right. Well, that's about right. That's within his normal time frame for going home. If he returns home, we would expect him to stay there for an hour or so, um, and then go out again, and then we're on. That, 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 if he does that, that's the pattern we're looking for. Um, that would be, hopefully, to whatever is his regular afternoon activity. In which case, we'll be able to identify whether that involves children, which is the whole purpose of the day. It's looking satisfactory so far. But I'm almost always proved wrong, so I'm sure today will be no different. <laughs> The suspect's regular afternoon activity appears to be drinking in a pub. There will be no more surveillance on him, but the police will return to search his home for any evidence that may help their case against him. Other members of the major investigation team are in Southampton. As a result of an investigation into a ring of paedophiles in southern England, they have intelligence that a man named Stephen Harriet has a large collection of indecent images of children and is in regular contact with local young girls. The police believe that he is using his position as the assistant warden of his block of flats to befriend single mothers with the intention of grooming their children. Oh! 
drive in the bath full of water and I want yeah, to film it in situ. Yeah. Can you just come in and yeah. do that for me? Yeah. Right, we're bringing in a camera here just so that we can film exactly what's happening here with your computer equipment in the bath. Mr. Harriet, if you stay with these officers, stay with you, you're just going to get dressed. I will explain to you exactly what's happening. And once you are dressed, I will explain fully exactly why we're here and what we are going to do today. Okay? If you stay with these officers and get dressed first. Mr. Harriet, as I explained to you, I'm a police officer from the Metropolitan Police. My name is DC Hillary Lum. I'm in possession here of a, of a search warrant for your premises, which has been issued by the local magistrates' court under Section 4 of the Protection of Children Act. The reason for the search is that we have information that you may have paedophilia, pornography, at your address. And what we intend to do is conduct a full search of your flat. Have you got, to your knowledge, any pornography, child pornography here at your flat? No. During the search, DC Lum is approached by a concerned neighbour who wants to talk about Harriet. It's about quarter to ten, ten to ten. Front door bell went. And I looked through and saw a girl stood there. Just the one, but there was another one there, but I didn't see her because she was stood sort of out the way. Mm. And I said, I saw, I opened up front door and I said to her, wow, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And I looked at her and she had no shoes on. Mm. And I said to her, what's, what's the matter? And she said, oh, nothing, one flat, we're looking for Steve. Right. And I said, right. Okay. And she said, and she just went there and went into the flat. Like, what is the young girl doing? Knocking, looking for Steve at 10 o'clock at night. No, she's on. If it was his niece or whatever and she yeah. was staying there, then she would have left this flat. But where was she going at 10 o'clock at night with no mm -hmm. shoes on? How old do you think she was? <sighs> I'd say about 10. And it's, it's last week, the week before, I was looking out the window in the morning saw Steve leaving and he had two young girls with him then and one was well one only looked about six six seven she had a school uniform on and it was a red jumper the other one was older like 12 something like that you just walk just walk with me the police cannot arrest Harriet because there is no immediate evidence that he is in possession of indecent images of children. They ask him to accompany them while they search another address he is known to stay at. Right, if you can sit in there for a minute. The search team seizes the computer that Harriet put in the bath. It is sent to the computer lab where a forensic analyst succeeds in retrieving the material Harriet was trying to destroy. He shows the disturbing evidence to the officers on the case. There's about 46 movies there in the whole series. Wow. 46, yeah. Uh, they vary in length and in content. You can see that one's quite clearly a child. Uh, there are mainly females. It, 
we had some particularly nasty ones in uh, one of your statics and reference. Basically bestiality involving children. This is the first time I can recall seeing bestiality of the children. Um, uh, I certainly had thousands of pictures. Yeah. It was worse than I thought, actually. Did you? Um, yeah. The bestiality. I that's the bestiality. Quite, I mean, that's just disgusting. And uh, the kid with the the kid with the um, with the hood over its head. That was, that was the really little girl quite vile, the wasn't end. it? Horrific. The Great Dane as well. They'd actually bound the dog's feet and paws. taped the paws and taped oh, it up. They didn't want it to scratch the child. Yeah, they didn't want it to scratch the child, but they didn't mind it. Oh. The police have decided to arrest the ex-PE teacher. They now have seven former pupils who have come forward, and the allegations now include indecent assault and buggery. Right, morning. I'm Detective Constable Neil Albrecht, and I'm from the Child Protection Major Investigation Team at East Ham. Um, sorry for coming in really early, but there really is no choice with this particular bloke because he goes out religiously at 5.37 every morning, so we have to start early for him. Um, to cut a long story short, we're out today to arrest um, a lifetime paedophile who's a retired wrestler and retired teacher. We've been investigating him for about six months now, our team. We've got seven allegations from various former pupils when he was a teacher, including buggery. What we plan to do, because we know from, from our own surveillance that he comes out at 5.37 to go to work every morning, rather than doing rapid entry and securing the premises that way, we're just simply going to wait outside for him and when he comes out we'll arrest him. Um, if he doesn't come out, then we've got an enforcer which we will use after about 15 minutes. If he doesn't come out at 5.37 then we will put the door in about quarter to six. One of the reasons we think he might be having contact with children is that when we've been doing surveillance he's been wearing very child-oriented clothing certainly a Pokemon t-shirt and on this occasion on the camera that what looks to me like some sort of club sweatshirt with like some sort of cartoon animal with writing around it so we're very interested in any basically going through all of his clothing obviously any child's clothing that we'll take mm. um, but also anything which gives us any reason to think that it's it's related to a child or that it's just childlike you know it's a Disney sweatshirt we'll take anything like that at all despite the fact he's been investigated numerous times certainly he's been arrested twice in the last three years for indecency offences against children. He's never had his address searched. So we want to absolutely find anything that is in there at all. Our view is that he's probably got involved in some sort of organisation club in order to get access to children. So mainly today we are after documents, every conceivable kind of document. We want to know everything there is to know about his lifestyle um, so that we can conduct further inquiries and locate any other children he might have abused recently. Can you open the door, please? It's the police. If you don't come and open the door, we're going to break it open. You've got 20 seconds. There's no 
Want one behind the door? Go for it. Tidy, but clear. Yeah. <coughs> I think he's gone early, mate. Well, in that case, we can't search, can we? We'll have to go and make him at work. Yeah. Come on, there. Out. Come out on this ride, no, he he hasn't come, come out. out otherwise. The only thing is, if he'd stayed somewhere else and gone to work, if he'd stayed with a mate mm. last night, he'd been on the bevy or something. He might have missed it. He could be. Good morning, Doug. Is there another bloke that normally works here in the morning? Is yeah. he here today? He'll be back on Monday. Yeah, where he's gone? Yeah, he's on the other man. He's <laughs> gone to the other man? Yeah, he went on the right. Do you know, has he got friends or relatives there or something? No, he's gone to a hotel. A hotel? Do you know yeah, what hotel? Been. Pardon? Do you know the name of the hotel? No, I just couldn't tell you. Man. No. Has he gone with anyone else or has he just gone on his own? He's just three days off. But has he, has he gone with any friends or has he just gone no, on his own? Friends, yeah. Because the suspect is not there, the police obtain a warrant to search his flat. It's a penalty because it's a penalty. And RJB 16, there's 14 at the video. 14. I give my permission for three boys to go to school on a school trip to France with Mr. and share a hotel room with him. No date. Uh, in the kitchen, apparently. Yeah. Allegedly. I've got my respirator in the van, I might get that. Oh my god. No, no, that's what I said. Okay, can we have this? Yeah. Come on. Of course. Cupboard. Cupboard. Yeah. At the end of the day, with this inquiry, there's a huge amount of evidence already been gathered. I mean, you know, a lot of statements have been taken direct evidence of him committing offences, a lot of corroboration from other witnesses, um, a lot of similar fact evidence with almost identical offences being committed against you know, different people that didn't know each other. So if we don't find any evidence to do with the school allegations, it's not a problem because we've got plenty already. Um, if we don't find any information linking him to any other children or, or anything else to do with children, then we've done all we can. Um, We'll be as satisfied as we can be that he's not having contact with children. You can never know that for certain, but at least, at least we will have tried. Um, but it's, you know, this is not a sort of uh, win or lose day. It's a you know win-win day. Um, either we find bonus information or we don't. Go get some fresh no. Oh, I had a little bit of the old uh, bile come up. Give him some medical Oh, you're a big Right. And then all these. Oh, you're a big After eight hours of searching, there is no evidence to suggest that their suspect is currently abusing children. But the team will have to sift carefully through the seized material. First, they must arrest him on his return from the Isle of Man to interview him about the allegations of sexual abuse. DC's Neil Albertson and Jackie Sabir are at the airport to meet him. Excuse me, are you Mr. Yeah. Can I just have a quick, quick word for you? I'm Detective Constable Neil Albertson from the Child Protection Major Investigation oh, Team yeah. at East Ham. I have to tell you that you're under arrest for offences of buggery and indecent assault on boys at the <laughs> school. You don't have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you fail to mention when questioned, something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may yeah. be given in evidence. Yeah. Okay, you understand all of that? Yeah. What we're going to do now is take you in a police car to Bethnal Green Police Station, yeah. where we're going to interview you about those allegations. Okay? 
Hey. I'm trusting you to behave yourself, Mr. So I'm not going to handcuff you or anything like that, but I will be sitting in the back with you, okay? Yeah. Well, just take a seat. Mind your head. Under formal interview, he denies that he ever abused any of his pupils at school. He does admit to using the double-barreling punishment, but claims that the boy's buttocks were never bare. On the day of his arrest, another former pupil comes forward with allegations of indecent assault. The ex-teacher is charged with 18 counts of indecent assault and one count of buggery, and is remanded in custody overnight. The next morning, he appears before a magistrate who releases him on bail until the start of his trial. With eight victims making serious allegations against him, the police believe they have a strong case. There's no guarantees on whether we're going to get a conviction. I feel very strongly that we've got an awful lot of evidence. Um, the, you know, in our favour, the victims don't know each other. Um, they haven't met each other from school from 20, you know, with, uh, over 20 years. Um, and they've come together with very similar accounts of what's happened to them. So that, you know, like we said to Mr. in the interview, there can only be two reasons why this has happened. A, all these witnesses who never knew each other have got together to concoct this story, or B, it's what happened. So I do feel that, you know, we have a very strong case, and I'm really hopeful that we will get a conviction, and he will, if convicted, go away for a long time. The police are confident, but the alleged offences took place a long time ago, and the victims did not come forward at the time. I was, I was probably more scared talking to the police than what Mr. D was doing to me. I, I, I was absolutely petrified telling the story because I had to go back all them years. I had to go back 21 years. I, I, I was shaking like a leaf because and it, 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 the way I'm explaining to him what he'd done was like being in that locker at the time. You know, uh, that's why it's so scary. You know, it, it was like, like, like him being in that room. Mr. was in that room while I was talking to the police. I'm explaining to him what he's doing. It feels like that he's doing something to me, you know, when I'm talking to him. I think what, what people need to accept is that really not telling anybody is the norm. It's not the strange, weird, inexplicable, you know, odd thing to do. It's the normal thing to do for most people. Um, in my experience, it's very rare to find a child that will come forward straight away and tell someone the same day or the next day. That's not normally how it happens. Um, and I think people, particularly judges, have difficulty getting their head around this idea that what they're seeing in a historical case is not some odd, um, suspicious, devious thing that someone's done, but it's actually the way normal human beings behave. And the other thing you need to remember is that people don't decide to wait. They don't decide that they're not going to tell anyone now and they'll tell someone later when it's the right time. And that They decide not to say anything. People make a decision that they're not going to tell anybody. And then something will happen later on in their life that makes them reevaluate that decision. It may be that the person that abused them has now got access to a, another child that's one of their younger relatives. Um, it could be, with like one case we had, where someone sees a documentary about the subject and is given the confidence by someone else's example to come forward. Um, it can be as simple as that a couple of police officers turn up unannounced on your doorstep and ask you about the school that you went to or the children's home you were in and suddenly an opportunity is presented to you to report something that you had never intended to report but there they are so you tell them. DS Rob Brown and his colleagues have gathered this morning to pay a surprise visit on Peter Saint. This is not the first time that Saint has attracted the attention of the child protection team. In the last 30 years, he has had 14 convictions against him for sexual offences against children. He is currently serving a three-year sentence for sexually assaulting a young boy, but he is on release from prison under license from the Home Office. He is in regular contact with other known paedophiles, and now the police have received intelligence that he may be offending again. Mr. Saint, 
Yes, Brian. My colleagues from the Child Protection Major Investigation Team, the East Ham. I'm in possession of a warrant to enter and search your premises for paedophilic material, which I intend to do in a moment. When we've all got our breath and sorted ourselves out, I'll show you the warrant and I'll explain what the procedure will be today. Is it uh, quite an old diary? Do we know what year it is? 94. Right. This. Mm hmm Has it got his name in it at all? Yeah. Yeah, there's min mentions in there. We've come across quite a few photographs of young boys aged about 14, it seems to us. I invited him in to uh, look at these photographs that we found in his bedroom um, and he has uh, basically he said that they're his and he was arrested by myself but um, just before one o'clock on suspicion of possession of indecent photographs. He claims they're not indecent and they're not boys. Obviously that will be a matter for a uh, judge or jury to decide. Five and it's a 13 a video of the I'm going to check the number there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. I don't know what you intend to do with these. Just watch them. That one is children's performance. That is <laughs> children's That's what it's like. Just the one that. The children's performance, 1993. Peter Saint is under arrest on suspicion of possessing indecent photographs. He is taken to a local police station to be interviewed and is later released on bail. Among the material seized from Saint's home, DS Rob Brown has found a video containing images of child abuse. Because Saint has previous convictions, this may be sufficient evidence for a custodial sentence. Right, well what we've got is, it's a copy of a commercial video uh, and it's a fairly bad copy so I think it's been bootlegged a number of occasions. It's of a number of youth, some of which are I'd say barely 16 but at least one uh, is definitely under 16 and uh, they're engaging in acts of um, mutual masturbation, oral sex and buggery basically to, to say unfortunately it's become known as the usual because we see so much of it um, and uh, it's, it's just um, there's some somewhat sketchy plot based around them all turning up at some d d abandoned factory in a uh, in a forest looks like somewhere in Germany or Central Europe and um, yeah, since I don't speak German I've no idea what the plot is but basically um, they're uh, engaging in oral sex after about 30 seconds so they obviously get on very well the indecent photographs seized from Saint's house on the day of his arrest feature a boy that Saint claims is 17. The police suspect that he is under 16 and are keen to find him. DC Neil Albertson has traced a youth with the same name that was written on the pictures. Because the youth has been in trouble with the police, his details are on file at a nearby police station. In a sense, child protection is not the business end of it all because I think that most people who behave badly in whatever way, whether it's they get tangled up in drugs or they, they're involved in prostitution, crime, later on, or, or child abuse later in life, generally speaking, there is some sort of episode in their past that could be 
called abuse, whether it's sexual abuse or that they were, you know, emotionally abused, neglected or, or physically abused. There's always something. I, I personally, and it, it, maybe it's a prejudice, but think that children that have extremely happy, fulfilling, unabusive upbringings are far, far less likely to find themselves in any kind of trouble um, and less likely to be involved in crime um, or, or to turn out to be paedophiles or anything like that. So I, I think that if we could just get a grip on the treatment children receive, we'd go a long way to reducing crime across the board. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it can't be any coincidence that, that when we arrest our paedophiles, the majority of them tell us that they've been a victim of abuse at some point, if they're, if they're talking to us at all. And that's the ones that tell us, and I'm sure others don't. Saint's sort of speciality is that he's in everyone else's business, really, um, other paedophiles. He, he, he sets himself up as a sort of, you know, prison visitor, advisor, lay advisor. Um, I mean, we know he visits people in prison a lot, and he you know, has other paedophiles around his house. We know he's a paedophile, he's got prison convictions for it. But um, the issue in this case is we know, it's, it's a strange way around, we know all the evidence is there. We know he's we possessed the photograph, we know he's, he's shown the photograph, distributed it. The issue is, is it an indecent image of a child? It looks on face value like it is an indecent image of a child. Um, However, if you can trace the, the person in the photograph, then you're duty-bound to locate them and, and find out if they remember what age they were when it was taken. Um, it's a difficult thing. I mean, you know, if you've been a, a victim of child abuse and you've been, you know, the subject of pornography when you were a child, and uh, 10, 15 years later someone bowls up with a photograph of you from your past and waves it under your nose and says, is that you? Very, very strong temptation just to say no, I suppose. But I, I would very much doubt that he really was 17. Um, as it says in the photograph. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look 17 to me. The eye colour, no, I don't know. See, it looks like him, except that the eyes are a different colour. No, I don't think that's him. No, I've decided I don't think that's him. Lovely, cheers. The detectives will have to continue their hunt for the boy in the pictures. Saint is out of prison on license. The Home Office may recall him to prison because he has been arrested. The video found at his house could result in another sentence. The Child Protection Major Investigation Team for West London has rushed to Earl's court. They have reliable intelligence that a convicted paedophile with a history of attempted abduction of young boys is working at the boat show and is planning to strike there. We've recently had information that a predatory paedophile uh, may, may be at large during the course of the boat show. Mm -hmm. We believe that he's, he has a knowledge of Earl's court and we believe that his method will be to lie in wait in one of the cubicles of a male toilet. And we're 100% confident it will be a male that he'll go for. Probably a boy between 10 and 13 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, he will lie in wait in the toilet, wait until uh, an unaccompanied boy comes into the toilet and then he'll try and seriously decently assault him. The suspect has a list of convictions dating back to 1981. In 1995, he was caught hiding in the toilets of a school in Brighton. In his rucksack, he was found to have a nine-inch carving knife, a sheet, a boy's school tie and shirt, six sash cords, and a can of cider. When the police searched his home, they found maps of Brighton, Slough, Maidstone and Windsor. He had marked each map with the location of schools, the name of the headmaster and the location of local parks. In 1999, during the model exhibition at Olympia, he attacked and sexually assaulted a 13-year-old boy in the toilets. He was sentenced to four and a half years for indecent assault and false imprisonment. It's now seven months after his release from prison, 
and he has a cleaning job for a company exhibiting at the boat show. His pass gives him access to all areas in Earl's Court. The police have a policy not to reveal the identity of convicted paedophiles unless there are exceptional circumstances. For now, all DS Roland Phillips can do is give a description of the suspect to the security staff. How many toilets are there up here? There are quite a few or? Five. Yeah? Five. They're, 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 they're the first one. Right. Okay, let's just have a quick look. Yeah. Yeah, same. Yeah, you're in charge. Somebody up. Okay. Yeah, we will do in a few minutes, pal. Oh, Christ, that's tucked away. Yeah. We'll take these. And how many of these have we got? Have we got loads, loads throughout the building. Thirty. Shall we go to the hall? It's a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge basement area with all kinds of little hidey holes. Um, my risk assessment on this is this guy's got all kinds of access which um, would allow him you know, they set up a lair or entice a child somewhere, uh, and it's just too risky. If you put a hundred officers in here, you couldn't do it. Having had a quick scout around the place with the security staff, um, and I think the sooner that we can actually tell them who he is, give them a photograph and get them excluded, the better. Day one of the boat show is drawing to an end. There have been no sightings of the suspect. If he is there, he is successfully evading the police. The next day, a senior officer at Scotland Yard decides that the suspect is too dangerous to be allowed to roam free around Earl's Court. He gives permission for the team to show a photograph to security staff. I've got your photograph. Yes. Do you know what um, Roland said he can't actually write the name yeah. on or anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. You've got a physical description, haven't you? Yeah. I think it's five foot nine. And, uh, I mean, it might be that people here recognise him because he has been in the building, but the point is we, we would not yep. be able to no, do this. Yeah. Okay. So that's him there. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's two other photocopies of that, which you can put up or whatever. Yep. I can also show them to the security staff? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's been agreed. That's okay. fine. One of the security staff immediately recognises the suspect from the photograph. She confirms that she saw him the previous day. I can describe him. He's got dark hair. His oh. ears stick out like that. Okay. And his lips look like they're blown up. Right. Especially the top one. Okay. And he had the uh, olive green gabardine. It's gabardine, not nylon, was it? Right. Down to there. Okay. Right. And he had a sack, a rock sack, but I don't know what colour that okay, was. Because I didn't get that much nosy. Right, no, I am very nosy, though. Okay. Very observant. Well, I saw that. There's nothing wrong with that. Have you seen a picture of, yes, you've been I shown have. a picture today, yes. and do you think that was the same That person? was him. Yeah. I clocked it straight away. So how many times do you think you've seen him then? I've just seen him the once, go right. through, he went through from my entrance. Right, so this fella, you just didn't like the look of him? I just didn't like the look of him, I thought he, he looked creepy, let's put it like that. Right, and his eyes, yeah. he was very, okay. very, there's well, somebody in the, one of the television programs he reminds me of, and I can't work it out, okay. whether it's Emmerdale or the oh, oh, right. He well, looks like one of the guys in there. <laughs> Unfortunately, he'd lose me on that one. Would <laughs> I? <Yeah. laughs> um, right, look, I've got this picture again. Just have a, have a quick look. Yeah, you that is You're happy with that? Yeah, because okay. the one I've seen down there had a green shirt on. Right, and a jumper. Okay. Right. There are no further sightings of the suspect at the show and to the relief of the officers, there are no reports of indecent assault. But the police decide that to stop watching him now would be putting children at risk. OK, we need to uh, put a bit of speed on. Yeah. They keep him under surveillance and discover an alarming pattern. 
The suspect is regularly visiting Acton Shopping Centre, which is some distance from his home. He locks himself in a cubicle in the public toilets for hours at a time. He always has his rucksack with him. Yeah, he's dead. Oh, is that Dad? I don't think so. Uh, How old is he? He's about eight, yeah. He might be with him. Looks like he is, doesn't he? Yeah. Eight-year-old, approximately eight-year-old child into the uh, toilets, accompanied by another male, uh, adult male. Yeah, eight-year-old male, accompanied by an adult male. You ever see? Oh, oh, maybe not then. Uh, no, they're not together. So he's been in there two minutes. And as far as we know, there's no... Yeah, from the male who was appeared to be with the child is out of the toilets, leaving the child in the toilets. How long has he been in there for? Two minutes. And as far as we know, there's no one else in there, is there? No. This man, from what I read, from what I'm told, all the intelligence suggests he's a man who quite possibly will proactively offend. Those sort of people need to be managed in some way. Now, I personally don't subscribe to the view that we want to put posters through everybody's door telling them where this man is living. But I... But I, I I think I would like to see some sort of unit set up. Hostels, call them what you will. Clinics where these people can be located, monitored. Now there are immense sort of political difficulties in that, in that nobody actually wants any of, any of these hostels next door to them. 28, yeah? Yeah. Control from OP. Eight-year-old has been in the toilets for five minutes. Can we put a footy in just to check everything's all right, please? You see one zero. Can you come in? Is that on there? Yeah. is such that you're attracted to children and that that is what you desire and you want I'm not quite sure how people are cured of their sexuality and they've got to be managed and, you know the, the people who are offending need to be locked up this man is a worry it's a worry he's out there it's simply impractical to, to keep this sort of operation watching him for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It, it just won't happen. Mother, he's only about nine, isn't he? God. See which one's he going to go into with mother, hopefully. That's mum. Well, there was somebody else in there. Yeah, she's asking, is she, for a boy? There he is. Yeah, yeah. occasion he committed no offence, so the police are powerless to act. 
The team cannot maintain this level of surveillance indefinitely. They have to find another way of dealing with him. And it's left left towards the Axmith Road. We will go with him, please. Go with him. At East Ham Police Station, officers are logging the indecent images of children retrieved from the hard drive that Stephen Harriot tried to destroy by putting in his bath. DC Hilary Lum and DS Alan Hasler have found that many of the two and a half thousand downloaded images of child abuse are the worst they've ever seen. Female, child, can't tell exactly, but under 12, ejaculation into mouth by adult male. Two prepubescent children, one girl, one boy, six years, sexual act, one prepubescent female, six years, pose, thirty, That was just as a tiny one. There's only about two. Well, that's what I'm saying. With adult male penis. God. Um. Child. Um. Yeah. End zero one. Zero one. female child. Six years. Pose. Now there is the evidence against him, Harriet is arrested. In the three months since his flat was searched, he has bought a new laptop. This is taken by the officers to be checked for evidence of further offences. Harriet is annoyed that the police have alerted his employers about their inquiry. Do you understand why we do that though, Steve, do you? What's that? Why we have to contact, so when you're actually working in some capacity, you might have contact with children. Do you understand yeah, why we before, do that? Why, before, why, why were you charged? Yeah, well, while we're investigating something, yeah, we have to contact, so when you're actually working in some capacity, you might have contact with children. Do you understand yeah, why before, we do that? Why, before, why, why were you charged? Yeah, well, while we're investigating something, yeah, we have to let people know, otherwise we wouldn't be doing our job. So what's the point of being innocent until proven then? Well, you are innocent until you're convicted by a court, aren't you? Well, that's right. But, but yeah, there's still certain that's, we're talking about areas, though, there, Steve, aren't we? where areas. we have a duty to inform people if you're working with children and we have suspicion or belief, not, not just a report. While Harriet is being taken to a police station for questioning, officers visit a neighbour at the flats where he was assistant warden. Hello. I'm the detective sergeant in McCarthy for the major investigation. The major investigation. But nothing, nothing happened. <laughs> no, I mean obviously, and how well did you know the girls as well? I mean you've got two, two girls? Yeah, um, he came up basically when they were in bed. Never asleep. So he didn't really. Have they ever been down to his flat or anything? Oh, no, no. Right. Okay. And, and the reason we used to see him like in the morning. So obviously he was the warden. So, so was it weeks, months you knew him? Um. It must have been a couple of months, I suppose. Yeah. As I say, you know, he, he came up and then um, he came for a drink. I texted him one day. I saw him downstairs. He was having a rough time with money problems or something. He said, and um. Okay, he phoned me, I texted him and said, well, over the, you know, over the if you want to come over, and he did. And um, he walked us home. And that was, that was about it, really. I can't think of any other times. I mean, he did come up. I can't think of anything. No, no not to worry. I mean, you might think of I mean, it was generally, if he came up, it was to do with the assistant warden job. It wasn't anything, you know, 
can't think of anything to say. We've never left alone with the girls. Well, we've come back today and we've arrested Stephen this morning because we've examined his computer and there were images of child pornography on there of a serious nature. People who, who do this to children don't come across as weak, and they may be gaining access to the children. Analysis of his laptop reveals that he has downloaded a further 200 images of children, 60 of which will be included in the charges against him. He is arrested again and taken to a local police station for another interview. The reason for your arrest was because when we last came to see you on the 7th of February, um, you were arrested at that time for similar offences and a search was carried out of your room and in your room was a, a, a Dell laptop computer. Um, that computer was submitted to our laboratory for examination and images, indecent images of children were found on that computer. Do you want to say anything about that at this moment? Um, I'd like to know how they got on there. Right. I can only get two reasons really. And that's um, if someone's actually put a virus into my email address or whether it's been sabotaged. The amount of images that he had on there obviously show that his mind is just so set on looking at this stuff repeatedly. Um, and obviously that shows again in the fact that having seized that first computer and found the images on there, that in the meantime he hasn't even been able to wait and stop his obsession for looking at it and has had to go out and buy himself another computer and obviously set himself up again and, and viewed more and more of these images. So it just shows the obsessiveness, I suppose, of um, the character of someone like this. They're obsessed with looking at children. Every one of those pictures that we've seen, those thousands and thousands of images, is a child being abused. Every one of those pictures is a scene of crime. And um, people like Mr. Harriet are obviously exploiting those children and furthering the industry. Court, Stephen Harriet pleads guilty to 19 counts of making indecent images of children. He is remanded in custody and is awaiting sentencing. He lived with Saint between the ages of 15 and 17, but the police are not able to prove how old he was when the photographs were taken. However, Saint was also in possession of an indecent video. Mr Saint, I've got um, two pieces of news for you. First of all, the, the matters which you were arrested uh, by myself two months ago are being discontinued. I'm not seeing any further evidence. Shall we go? However, I've got to tell you that I'm uh, now going to arrest you on a further matter of uh, possession of indecent photographs of children, uh, specifically one videotape. Do you understand? I've got a caution, you say you don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence, you ought to mention one question, something which you later rely on in court. Okay, okay. Let's hope you go, okay. Your house, or you're saying the tape's not your house, but you've never seen it before? The tape has definitely come from my house. Them scenes have never come back from my house. It was stored in the area adjacent to the TV. So therefore that leads me to the, the reasonable assumption, I believe, that you've been watching that tape on a regular basis, otherwise you wouldn't have it to hand. You can believe what you want. Mm -hmm. You know more about that film than what I've ever done. I've never ever seen one of those films, any of those scenes in my life. Never ever. And I swear on my mum's, my children's lives, anybody's lives. What do you mean I know more about it than you do? Right. That's up to you. No. That's up to you. If you've got a point to make I'm, I'm saying I've never ever seen that film in my life. No, I understand that bit. But it's in your house. No, the, the video case was in my house. What's on the videotape? 
was in your house when it was seized. That's your words, it's not my words. Are you accusing me of bringing up Dr. Dan? I'm, I'm not accusing anybody of doing anything. Mm -hmm. Well, we view the tapes, we, we right. find what we find, we're putting it to you. Okay. Right. We're in charge of the police. When I see things like that, and I, I know what's going on, it's a pit up. Because I've you. never ever seen those scenes. Mm -hmm. Never ever. What do you mean by a fit up? Well, this will be my saying. investigation, I've been in charge of it, so you've got something to say, right. say to me. I'm an old boy. I've been here before and I've seen it before. I know what is going on. Well, well, if you want to charge me with six to eight minutes mm. of film, then please go ahead and charge me. Can we finish the interview? Uh, we'll finish it when you, you can stop talking if you want. Right. I'll stop talking whenever I want. That's the way it works, okay? Mr. Saint, there's yep. one charge. That's on or before 24th September 2002. Road you had in your possession indecent photographs of children mainly one videotape. It's contrary to section 160, Criminal Justice Act 1988. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. If you do not mention now, something which you later come to rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Uh, I think I've said enough. I think I've said enough. Okay, I understand there's representations to be made. I'm, uh, I'm asking for a reminder in custody. As aforementioned, Mr. Saint is a lifetime sex offender uh, with, as comes with that, an interest, a uh, sexual interest in children. Possession of this videotape shows that he continues to have a sexual interest in children. So I'm asking for him to be remanded in custody to protect the, uh, the children of London from this predatory paedophile. I have two, which the officers know, two ferrets in my home which run about loose. I also now have a budgie guard. I don't know. I, I've always returned on bail. I've never absconded and we're talking about one video which the opposite is not in dispute is maximum 10 minutes over, which shows about 10 seconds. Okay, so I've listened to uh, obviously the officer's recommendation. Obviously the subject uh, may be subject, if convicted, to a custodial sentence. And obviously, um, I believe it could be necessary that obviously the public needs protected from you. For those grounds, yeah, you remain in custody and go to court in the morning. If you wish to make phone calls or any other thing else to sort out your pet animals, there's not a problem. That could be done at a later time. Okay, sir? So which is the best one? Is that one sort of uh, reasonably clean? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, they've both been used today, but they're both clean, so you can have a choice. That one or that one. Do you want anything to eat? Do you want anything to eat? Yes, sir. Okay, right. I'll get you something. There's only lasagna. Will you have that? I don't know. Just a cup of tea. Just a cup of tea. All right. Okay. How long were we there for? More than six hours, going on seven hours, just to interview him about one ten or fifteen minute slot of one videotape. You can ask him a perfectly simple question like sort of why is this videotape you know on the shelf by the side of your television? Given that you've said you've never seen it before. And he'll go, Well I didn't say I didn't see it before and you'll go, Yes you did, you just said that five minutes ago. And then we have a long, complicated argument about that. Um, and then he'll maintain that he doesn't understand which videotape you're talking about. It's all good stuff. I mean, he's, he's, he's obviously had an awful lot of experience in police interviews, and he does, does what his best to tie you in a knot. He's absolutely convinced that the entire world is out to get him. He's absolutely convinced that there's a vast police conspiracy that will stand at absolutely nothing to convict him. Um, he doesn't appear to realise just how truly unimportant he is. Um, well, I started, as I always do, determined to give him an absolutely fair crack of the whip, because I try and do absolutely everybody. Um, but he just winds you up, and really what you have to do is just remember that this is a job, and, um, you know, just relax. I'm going home at the end of the day, and he's not. A 
At a magistrate's court, Saint is released on bail. However, the Home Office recalls him to prison because he has contravened the terms of his license. After a trial lasting a week, he is found guilty of possession of the video and receives a two-year prison sentence. Together with his existing sentence for indecent assault on a boy under the age of 14, he is not due for release until 2007. The suspect who has a history of indecently assaulting young boys in public toilets cannot be kept under surveillance 24 hours a day. The only course of action open to the police is to serve him with a summons. What's basically happened is because of your behaviour, your activity, we have, we the police, have concerns about your conduct. Okay. Your conduct. And we fear that you may commit offences against young boys. So what's happened is I personally have applied for a sex offenders order against you. There's two forms here. They're both summonses. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you need to be at Richmond Magistrates Court, 20th of March, 9.45, where um, I will say things to the court. You, in turn, have an opportunity mm -hmm. to discuss it with the court as well. What the order will say, uh, in essence, is that for the next five years, we're going to restrict your access to young persons, young males, mm -hmm. under the age of 16. Okay? So these two summonses, I'll serve them on you now. Okay, no so please be at court, yeah, we'll Richmond Magistrates Court, the 20th of March, mm -hmm. 9.45. Okay. Thanks for your help. You. Okay. He's a nice fellow, Mr. <laughs> Must care pointing with him sometime. <laughs> He's spoken to colleagues who've told me that he can't control his behaviour. It's so frightening, isn't it, that these time bombs are walking about. But he's not in isolation, there's a few, isn't there? He's been seen by two psychiatrists and neither of them came up with a solution for him. So what chance has he got? Mind you, at least he knows what he's like. I mean, there are some who uh, wouldn't accept what they are. Fuck right off! At court, a magistrate decides that the public should be protected and issues a sex offender order. This prohibits the suspect from a range of activities including seeking or being in the company of a young person under the age of 16, drinking alcohol in public toilets and carrying with him masking tape, rope or a knife. If he violates the order, he faces up to five years imprisonment. At the Old Bailey, there is a preliminary hearing for the case against the XPE teacher who faces allegations of sexual abuse from former pupils. The counsel for the prosecution reduces the number of counts from 19 involving 8 victims to 11 involving 4 victims. Some of the counts relate to double barrelling. Double barrelling has been graphically described by nearly every single person we've spoken to, whether it happened to them or not. But it involved um, any misdemeanour, sort of pee kit being dirty, being late, whatever. Um, it involved uh, Mr. standing in front of the boy, uh, facing each other, the boy bending over, um, and Mr. sort of clasping the boy's head in between his knees, um, pulling the boy's shorts down and bringing his hands up and over, palms up and slapping both their butt and cheeks. Um, and everyone describes that. Um, like I say, being hit with a slip or being hit with a ruler was general sort of rule of thumb at school then, but having your head clamped between someone's knees and your pants pulled down, I think any parent would be very concerned if a teacher was doing that to their child, especially if they knew he was a, a convicted paedophile. The reason that some of the charges have been dropped is that uh, council doesn't consider that she can call it an indecent assault unless he's taken the child's pants down. You know, it's a bare buttocks that he's hitting. Um, my view would be that his method of punishment, that what we call the double barrel, the, the simultaneous slapping of both buttocks with his hands, is so distinctive um, and so strange and unusual that really the jury should hear about every piece of evidence about that practice. 
Um, because what we will inviting them, be inviting them to do is to say that's not normal, this is not the normal behaviour of a, a teacher. Even in the 60s, that's not what teachers did. Um, and we'll, what we'll be fighting is, uh, you know, the, the tendency to say, oh, well, things were different then. It was the 60s, the 70s, you know, it's a different world. We can't judge it by today's standards. So I think we need as much information as possible to, to show that this was a man with almost rituals, you know, that, that the reason he did that in that way, head between the knees, hands on, you know, both hands at the same time, was because he enjoyed it. It wasn't because he was trying to correct the behaviour of difficult boys, it was because he enjoyed it. Not being able to use double barrelling doesn't allow us to put any of the other more serious offences within the context that this man is a career paedophile. Um, his grooming of children, his fear that he instilled in the children and his ability to subsequently abuse them it all essentially starts with the double barrel and the discipline within the, the uh, PE lessons. All the videos seized from the suspect's flat have been viewed and all the documents have been checked. Nothing illegal was found, so he is entitled to reclaim his personal property. It's a bit of a Frank Sinatra fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Don't make them like that anymore, do they? A trial date has been set at the Inner London Crown Court, and the police take photographs of the school where the alleged abuse took place. This is to help the jury visualise the scenes that will be described to them in the testimony given by witnesses. There still remain four victims who are willing to testify in court, and DC Albertson is confident that there is a very good chance of conviction. Witnesses amplify each other. The more you've got, the stronger they will look, because, you know, what's the chances of that, ladies and gentlemen? You know, what's the chances of this story matching that story matching that story? And it, it doesn't take many different people parading in a row to convince a jury that um, there must be something in it. So. I don't have, I mean, yeah, you can, you can lose any case, because courts are courts and juries are juries, but, you yeah, this is a strong case. I'd be surprised if they quit. Before the trial, the detectives on the case must attend one more preliminary hearing. They are in for a shock. The defence argues that the suspect cannot have a fair trial. The alleged assaults took place so long ago that some school records are missing and some witnesses have died. Go away. Also, in each alleged assault, it boils down to the suspect's word against that of the victim. Because of a ruling by the Lord Chief Justice in an earlier case, the prosecution barrister says she cannot counter the defence argument. The judge has no option but to stop the case, and for the second time in two years, the suspect escapes conviction. Now, if you don't go away, I can damage your camera. You have a choice. Basically, um, we've been ambushed, really. We, uh, we came into court this morning expecting that we were just going to uh, have a, uh, a mention, which we were going to sort of sort out all the, uh, the niggles, really, so the trial could, um, could go ahead uh, in October. And um, we've walked in and and basically found out that he's going to get away with it yet again. Um, oh, I feel sick. I feel absolutely sick. There are a lot of cases, not just in child abuse, but in all sorts of criminal sort of behaviour where, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to he did it or he didn't do it. You know, it, if someone's, you know, deceived someone or, you know, it's going to come down to this is what he said, officer, and did the jury believe that or not? And that's the whole point, isn't it, of having a jury trial. If it is just solely one word against the other, it's up to the jury to make the decision. And that's been taken away from these victims. That's what they have lost their ability to tell their story. To you know, we we believe them. We know what you know. We know what they've been through. They they've taken so much courage, and you know, it's been so difficult for them to come forward. Even now. And, and they, they've been really supportive, haven't they? All the witnesses have been really together. No one's even sort of wavered about coming into court. And, and they've lost that opportunity now. And, and he's got away with it again. And how many more people are going to get away with it in future that are still actively abusing children as well?
and that's a huge concern as well. That's another implication we've got to think about, really. Anybody, whoever they were, whether a lawyer, journalist, anybody that came to our office and looked through all of the, the statements and the documents and the records that we have about <laughs> un sort of bamboozled by laws and restrictions on disclosure and all the other nonsense we go through. Anybody that looks at the bare facts would conclude that <laughs> is a predatory paedophile who has spent his life not just abusing children, but deliberately seeking out opportunities to abuse children. That's obvious. That's, I mean, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's just fact. Um, and he's got away with it. And yet, time and time and time again, he's got away with it. He got a conviction for abusing a child and got a five pound fine, which is the only time he's ever been convicted. Um, subsequently managed to get a job working in a school, despite the conviction. Um, was investigated in the 70s and the CPS decided not to prosecute. That's the first, you know, first of his nine lies, if you like. Um, was accused again just before our investigation broke by another person. Got away with that as well. And now he's got away with this one. So that's three different investigations that he's come away smelling of roses. Uh, just because of the way the system works. It's, you know, the, the, you've got this whole a room, you could get a room full of people who would all say, I was sexually abused by I mean, I Unfortunately, that room is not a courtroom. The toughest part of the ruling for DC's Albertson and Sabir is having to break the news to the victims. What's actually happened? In February this year, Lord Chief Justice Wolf, he was trying a case, um, or he's the appeal court judge, he was ruling on an appeal. And it's a completely different historic abuse case, but they're sort of using this now as a template for all of them. Yeah. That case, I don't know how much Jack told you, but it was a one-on-one. -on -one. It yeah. was a, a woman accusing her stepfather of, right. um, sort of about 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, so again, very, very different from what we've got. But what the rulings are now, if all a defendant can say is that I didn't do it, yeah. then he can't get a fair trial. And that's it in a nutshell, Kevin. I mean, does that sort of... That's I, I can't believe it. I mean, I yeah. cannot believe that, you know, that kind of thing. I just can't believe it. I know. It's, it's beyond any kind of comprehension. I just cannot believe that he's going to walk after doing this yeah. to so m I mean, it, it was common knowledge at the school. He was known as queer boy because of all these antics that he used to do. He used to come in the showers with us. Yeah. You know, he used to have pants inspection. What teacher has a pants inspection? And then if you had skid marks in your pants, you had to do 20 press-ups. Yeah. And where other teachers would take football or rugby, he always liked to have contact sports. Mm. And the writing was on the wall, not just with the boys, but the teachers must have known. Yeah. They must have known that this man was doing this, oh. and they all turned a blind eye to it. And, you know, I, I can remember when I went home, and, and the first time I told my, my late mother that this had happened, that she, of course it doesn't happen at school, teachers don't do that, right. you know, and got a clip around the ear yeah. for, for saying such a thing. Uh, but it does happen, and it did happen, and this man's walked. And what message does that send out? That's well, the trouble. That's it. I mean, they, they, they've just got an open book to do whatever they want now. He can go back out now and do exactly, and he will, because he's sick. If you'd known this now, would you have come forward in the beginning? That it would... No, because it, it, it brought out a lot of things within me again that I'd locked away and pigeonholed away. And, and now, like, they've all been brought to the forefront again. And I must say, when, when I was being interviewed by one of your colleagues, and, and it got pretty intense. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a soft man by any stretch of the imagination. I come out there and I cry because I thought this dirty person yeah. just violated everything that I was about. And, and not only me, and, and, and all the other kids, you know, I mean, he used to like rub himself behind us. He'd mm. like, you know, he'd bite your bottom and, and, and you know, just all things. He'd, he'd put his hands through your legs and, yeah. and grab your testicles mm. and, what? What's this all about? And then you don't understand it. You, he's, he's in that position no, of trust. Sticking his tongue in your ear. And I remember once when he kissed me that he always used to smoke non-tip cigarettes. Yeah. And, st and, and this particular day when I was being interviewed by your colleague, I can remember that taste come back in my mouth. Mm. And I can never, ever, ever forget that. Because mm. I've never smoked. Yeah. And, and, and I could never, ever forget that, that this man used to stick his tongue down my throat. Mm. And, and it was just like one of the most disgusting thing. And making me go and pick the medicine ball up out of yeah, the shower. Yeah. 
you know, where he'd rub his penis behind you and, and you know, and, and he'd pull me out in front of the class because my mum was house proud and he'd go, this is how your kit should look and he'd be touching you and, yeah. and you know, because your mum had ironed your creases in your shorts. It's a classic, you couldn't get a much more stereotyped nope. paedophile, could you? And these judges are sitting in these ivory towers, mm. just letting them get away with it, where they're hiding, this, hiding behind this particular law or whatever mm. it is, they are letting paedophiles off. Something that you'll often hear from judges, certain judges, is this expression that allegations of, of sexual abuse are easy to make and almost impossible to disprove. Um, and if you actually think about the first part of that statement, that these allegations are easy to make, it, it's just ridiculous. I mean, uh, if your car is stolen, that's an easy allegation to make. You could walk into a police station and you say, your, my car's been stolen. Making an allegation of sexual abuse is a, a long procedure with uh, detailed interviewing and intimate details about the things that have happened to you. Um, and it's not at all easy. It's one of the most difficult things anyone could ever do. Um, so why that should be singled out as being the allegation that's easy to make, I don't know. Um, to sit down with a police officer for hours and hours describing a blow-by-blow -blow account of everything that's happened to you when you've not felt able to say anything about that, you know, for years, decades in some cases, is not easy. Um, and I think that's, that's almost insulting, that, that statement that people make. It's been six months since a sex offender order was placed on the convicted paedophile to stop him preying on boys in toilets. The Child Protection Major Investigation Team decides to continue with their surveillance. It's um, Abba and South, um, jeans, uh, dark coloured blue purple fleece and a large blue and black rucksack. And it's a loss of eye to the uh, OP. Yeah, down south. Is that left or right? Yeah, the uh, have the address and it's a left down towards the uh, football ground, over. Three eight six seven. It's a possible contact in Liddles. The subject is five Liddles. I think it's Liddles. It's just up, just up Colton Road. Seven zero walking through. Um, in a dark pink multi-coloured rucksack. Just examine that location. He's started doing a circuit, a short circuit around, small road, going left, right, left, right, and then doubling back on himself. So if you think about what you were saying this morning, it's almost an anti-surveillance walk, isn't it? Because from where he lives, it would have been to go straight down past the post office there, to go out there. No. One thing's possible, obviously, he's come here for the public toilets. I mean, I'm not familiar with this area, but I don't know if there are public toilets here at all, but that's uh, it's possible why he's come here. No, not a direction. He's working his uh, work right on a good look back at each junction. I'm supposed to call this off. He's down at a right right into Shoreham. Okay, from 6 eight. There's waves, there's waves. I'd like to call this, please. Yeah, he's I waved to him. Yeah, yeah. He's waved to him. Okay, stand down, stand down, please. He's waved to him. He's tumbled it, hasn't he? Right, he spotted them somewhere, didn't he? The suspect has told people he believes he is being followed all the time and he is constantly looking over his shoulder. The police are concerned that he remains a threat to children and may strike at any time. And there are others like him who they cannot put under permanent surveillance. If you have been affected by the issues on tonight's programme and would like to speak to an experienced advisor for details of organisations that can offer information and support, you can call the...